Hi, so welcome to our um, talk, uh, a walk through the Kubernetes UI landscape. Um, my name is Joaquin. I'm, I work for Kinfolk as a director of product engineering, and I'm here with Henning. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Henning, and I work for Zalando. Great. So without further ado, uh, what are we here to talk about? So as you know, Kubernetes is a complex uh, project, and of course, um, you know, uh, people can use the kubectl or kube control, uh, whatever you, you want to call it. Uh, but a way to make things simpler for everybody is to use graphical user interfaces. So uh, there are lots of projects out there, uh, and uh, we are here to talk about them. So we have uh, we had to to have some criteria in selecting those uh, projects, uh, and those are uh, those have to be open source projects. They have to be uh, under active development. So that means that they had a release in the last 12 months. Um, they have to be used standalone. So, you know, not needing uh, add-ons or, con or control plane for them to, to be usable. Uh, and um, they can run, of course, either locally or in cluster, but they have to be just, just that, just running standalone. And they have to have a graphical user interface. Um, yeah, some of the things we, we, we look into and we'll mention this uh, is uh, the installation. So is a project uh, supposed to be running cluster or locally on your desktop? Or, um, you know, uh, does it have multiple uh, cluster support or j uh, does it only manage one cluster at a time? Uh, whether it's extensible or not, uh, read-only, or whether you can uh, read and write, uh, and other things we'll talk about. So you see these icons here, they will be on each slide. Uh, in case we don't talk about this uh, uh, directly, you will know hopefully what it means. So let's start. Yes, let's start with a, a Kubernetes dashboard. Next slide. So uh, the official Kubernetes dashboard is um, pretty old. It's uh, compared to the other projects. It's from 2015, first release 2016. It's um, a tool you deploy to a single cluster and provides a workload overview for application developers. Uh, you authenticate with a service account token. So you do kubectl proxy and then uh, still need to copy the bearer token um, into the first form. It provides some features like executing into pods, uh, logs, uh, scaling workloads, and editing your uh, deployments, for example. It also provides a nice feature for searching across uh, different workloads in the cluster, so you can quickly find what you're looking for. Uh, but it has a, overall a relatively limited set of features, and it's not um, extensible. Um, so overall, um, I would say uh, the oldest and official Kubernetes dashboard um, is um, uh, interesting to get an overview of workloads, um, but um, doesn't have too many features. Um, you might uh, need for further troubleshooting. Right. And uh, by the way, do you think uh, still that, uh, you know, being the, the official uh, dashboard, uh, do you think it still lives up to, to its, uh, you know, to, to its role? Or do you think people should look into other things now that we've looked into a bunch of stuff? I think it still uh, makes sense to check out the Kubernetes dashboard, um, but it's, there is a huge hurdle with the authentication. So it, I think the project doesn't really know what it wants to be, if it's now a local tool or something deployed. So you have to deploy it to a cluster, but you still need a kube config or a bearer token to authenticate. So it doesn't integrate with other authentication providers. Um, so in this way, um, it's a little bit in between uh, the local and uh, hosted solutions we will see later on. Right. And the next one uh, is actually, um, you know, it's, it has many similarities with, uh, with the, the official Kubernetes dashboard. So it's also running cluster. It's also um, meant to, to only manage one cluster. And uh, it's it's not extensible uh, as well. So this is called uh, Kate Dash, and um, uh, it started as a project by uh, someone uh, called Eric Herbranson. I hope I pronounce his name uh, correctly. And uh, um, it was stopped for a while, uh, but then 
Uh, I think Indeed uh, took over and uh, now uh, it's managed by Indeed, uh, still with, with Eric on the project as, I, as far as I can see. Uh, you know, this is an interesting project because like I said, uh, it provides a good alternative uh, to, to the official uh, dashboard, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and it's also it also feels very lightweight. So, uh, you know, the UI uh, is kind of snappy in comparison, at least last time I checked both of them. Um, that said, of course, the, the UI could maybe be uh, a bit refined uh, from a design point of view or usability. Uh, one nice thing that it has is that the, the editor shows uh, documentation. So when you're editing some, some resource uh, you can and you don't remember exactly when uh, what things go here and there, you can just quickly look into it. Um, yeah, and uh, one uh, thing is that, uh, well, a difference that uh, with, uh, with the official one is that it does not have uh, cluster search. And also uh, when I tried it with a view only uh, token, uh, it kind of failed uh, to start the, the you know, the, the UI. Um, but otherwise, it's a, it's a good project, in my opinion. So you already mentioned some differences to the official Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, what would you now recommend? What would you install in your cluster, um, just looking at these two? Yeah, at least from you know from when I tried the official uh, one and, uh, and Kate Dash, I would say I would uh, go with uh, Kate Dash. Um, for the reasons I said, uh, but also, for example, if you want to, to change something uh, on, on, on one of the projects, I think it should be easier to do it on Kate Dash just because the code base seems, uh, uh, you know, uh, a bit smaller than, of course, a project that has been here for a while, like, like the official Kubernetes dashboard. So, yeah, I'll go with this one, I think. Yeah, let's have a look at another project, Cubius. Um, Cubius is quite different to the uh, other two dashboards we saw earlier uh, because it's really about um, seeing app config and state and um, yeah, checking um, if the state is safe and um, following some of the rules you can define in, in the rule editor in, integrated into this project. So it really helps you analyze your cluster. You can define custom rules, for example, um, that you don't want to run um, Docker latest tag or um, special settings, uh, for example, requiring memory limits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can also have custom marker uh, icons. So I think this is a really interesting tool for, for example, platform teams to define um, uh, compliance rules um, and then check the cluster um, accordingly. Another very interesting feature is time machine. So you can go back and forth into in, in time and see when something changed and for example, correlate this when uh, with something going wrong in your cluster. Uh, so for example, label added or, or removed, etc. The whole tool is only single cluster and it also has a stripped down portable version uh, because the time machine uh, uses the MySQL database in the back end. So uh, you can use the portable version, but then you don't have the time machine. Yeah, it's uh, only a read only uh, tool, only single cluster extensible by these custom rules. Yeah, that certainly looks interesting. So my question is, um, you. You know, uh, what do you think of this uh, time machine feature in comparison with, for example, GitOps, which also give you like a, a way to, to see which operations happen? Yeah, I guess the time machine is a really interesting uh, feature and it can really help to um, troubleshoot if, when something is going wrong and then checking what was changed in the cluster. But obviously like most of the changes should be done via CICD and maybe GitOps. So all the changes should be tracked in Git. Uh, but you might also op uh, use something like Postgres operator or other operator, which also changes cluster state. So the time machine would help you see these uh, cluster state, state changes, which are not reflected in Git. Um, that being said, I never tried this time machine with a big cluster with many changes going on and many resources. So I'm not sure how this scales with the database. Frankly. Great. Yes, uh, Octant, that's a, a pretty popular uh, tool. It's only locally available. It was created by VMware. It has a, a quite nice UI and it's created for developers to better understand the complexity for, of Kubernetes clusters. So you start a local tool, tool and then see the UI in, in your browser. And um, it has some interesting features like this object graph. So you see resources and uh, connected resources like for a pod, the service, ingress, secrets, etc. And it has a very nice feature of port forwarding. So you can go to a, a pod or a service 
and um, then uh, enable port forwarding and you don't have to uh, switch between command line or terminal and the browser because it directly happens in your browser and you can open the, um, the tool. It also provides plugins. There's also a recent plugin created for Jenkins X. Uh, so if you use that, maybe it's worth checking out. It's a little bit sad that the tool doesn't have a global search. So you cannot just search for something in the, in the cluster like what is integrated in Kubernetes dashboard. And it provides um, access to multiple clusters you defined in kubeconfig, but it doesn't have any cross cluster features. Great. Um, so since Octant opens a, a browser window, so it's, it's a local application, but it does not ship its, um, you know, its own browser view uh, or web view. Uh, like others do. Do you think this is an advantage or a disadvantage? I think it's both, uh, but I certainly can see some advantages, uh, for example, uh, using bookmarks, because if you use a standalone tool, then um, you often yeah, have not the um, feature of having bookmarks in the app itself. And with Octane, you have uh, your normal browser, you can bookmark, for example, your deployment or your workload you usually look at. And I think that's um, pretty neat. Um, so you can reuse features from the browser. Great. And the next one is actually um, similar uh, in a way. So it's also uh, an application that one runs locally. It's also multi-cluster. And uh, it was actually, uh, uh, so it's called Lens, and uh, it was actually a proprietary uh, tool by a company called Contena, but the company did not succeed. And uh, at, at that time, uh, the, I think some of the employees uh, may, made this project open source. And then Mirantis, as far as I understand, uh, purchased uh, or acquired the assets from uh, Contena. And now we have a, an open source application. So, uh, like I said, this is this is similar uh, to to Octant in the way that it runs locally, but it's a uh, it's like a, a full application in a way that it ships its own web view. And one thing that I really really like is that the, the so the the user interface and the user experience is really nice. Uh, it you can access a lot of information, but it all seems to be um, very well, uh, you know, uh, in a good layout and very well thought of. Uh, it also has like a Helm chart store. And uh, uh, another interesting thing is that, uh, as far as I could understand, it ships uh, a kubectl uh, with it. So you, if you update the application, you always have an updated kubectl. Uh, and you can use a terminal ri right away from the application itself. So yeah, it does not really have cross-cluster features. Uh, so no, uh, and also no like big search. Uh, or anything, and uh, it's also not extensible. So it uh, looks pretty polished, uh, Lens. Um, yeah, how would you compare it to Octant? Both tools are local, so which one should I install and use? Yeah, uh, so both are, are similar, that, that's true. For me, I would probably go with Lens, just because I, I think, uh, you know, in terms of, of the UI, uh, it works really well, and uh, not only it looks good, but it, it actually, you know, the way things are laid out again, and the capabilities you have are really good. Uh, so I would go with with Lens, for sure. Uh, yeah, and the, the next project is a very curious one that is different from the rest. Uh, it's called CubeNav, and uh, uh, yeah, so this one works on your mobile uh, on your mobile phone uh, on uh, on your cluster and also on your desktop and it allows you to manage uh, several uh, clusters as well um, uh, i said it was a curious one not only because it allows all this but also because um, you know it's a, it's a mobile first in a way that uh, as far as i understand they focus on the mobile experience first and this reflects on the desktop ui so uh, if, if, you, if you go and you list some, some of the resources available in, in the cluster, you don't see the typical table in there. Uh, you rather see a list. Uh, so, and this makes things a little bit more complicated to, um, you know, to, to understand uh, sometimes, uh, at least in my, uh, in, in my experience with it. Uh, because you don't see like, okay, this column is about uh, the, the, the creation date. You actually see an entry in the, in the entry itself of the, of the list with the creation date or something. So, that, so, so yeah, so there is that, that downside, I would say. Uh, but if you're looking for something uh, beyond the, the desktop, uh, 
this would be a solution, I think. Uh, one thing that was not clear was how to authenticate with it. So I think it just took whatever was on the on the cube uh, config. And also uh, there is no cross, uh, no cross cluster features. Uh, so no, no global search. So um, do you think uh, having a mobile app is, is important for, for like managing Kubernetes clusters or workloads? I think that uh, in times where, uh, where uh, people can travel, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's important to have a way to just quickly uh, check on your clusters when you when you are uh, on the app in the airport or something. But I think that for for a day to day operations uh, tool, uh, I think of course I, I would rather use something that focuses uh, on uh, on a, on an experience that we used to with the with a laptop or a, you know desktop computer. Yeah. So the next one, I have to give a, a small uh, disclosure first. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a project I'm involved in. So this is a, uh, called Headlamp, and it's a project created by Kinfolk. Um, you can run this project uh, also locally as an application for for your uh, you know computer, or also in the cluster. Uh, it has multi uh, multi cluster support. And uh, one of its core features uh, is that we have uh, what we call front-end plugins. So you can have a plugin, uh, you know, just uh, let's say we don't have a, a graph view. So let's say that you want to create a, a graph view. You can create a plugin for that. And then the idea is that the plugins are actually outside of the of the cluster, right? So, sorry, of the of the UI. So when you start the the UI, you can point it to uh, directly with plugins, and they will be available. Um, Another thing is that the uh, so all the cluster actions we, we have uh, at the moment, like editing, for example, a, a deployment or something, uh, those have a grace period when you click apply. So if you are editing something and you click apply, uh, you you suddenly notice that you made a mistake. You can just click cancel. Uh, so it gives you like a small grace period for you to uh, kind of undo uh, or cancel what you were about to do. Uh, yeah, another, another thing that I think it's uh, makes for a, a good user experience is that we we don't assume that the users uh, have a, a full administration uh, capabilities in the cluster. So if you don't, if you cannot really edit uh, um, a resource because you don't have that role in a cluster, we don't show the the, the edit button or the delete button, for example. Uh, yeah, and uh, we do have like stuff like keyboard shortcuts uh, and other features, but we do not have like um, a cross cluster uh, search, for example, even if we have multiple cluster support. So, so that's something we don't have. So what was your motivation to create Headlamp? Yeah, so uh, Kinfolk has a, um, a Kubernetes distribution called Locomotive. Uh, and at first, of course, we wanted something uh, that we could use as a UI for it. So we looked into the existing projects um, and uh, and the idea was okay. We take one of these and we modify it. We we keep a fork of it or we contribute what we can back. But at the point uh, at that point we realized none of the of those projects uh, actually had all that we wanted. So we decided to create a project uh, and um, a UI uh, project, but not one that was like intimate or very intimate with uh, with locomotive. Instead, we wanted to create basically what we were looking for. So we created this uh, project called Headlamp, and the idea is that for locomotive, we will take this and we will, you know, create a couple of plugins uh, that will be more intimate with this project. So hopefully, other people can, uh, you know, use it as well. Okay, next one. Um, it's actually my project. I wrote a, a blog post last year about Kubernetes Web UIs, and um, I didn't really find uh, what I was looking for, so I created Kubernetes Web View. Uh, this is really focusing on read only view for multiple clusters and advanced features. Uh, so I said it's kind of a kubectl for the web and um, really for support and incident response. So something you would deploy as a platform team and provide this uh, to your users. Um, so you can always use permalinks to link to certain pods or certain views or um, certain errors or logs. And this just works across multiple clusters. It uses plain HTML and CSS. It also is responsive. So you can also open this on your smartphone um, if you're traveling. And um, it also has multi-cluster uh, features. So you can search for workloads across uh, uh, many clusters. 
and it provides advanced uh, queries and filters. So for example, you can quickly look for all nodes with a certain version or a certain taint um, uh, across many clusters. Uh, so the whole uh, tool is customizable. So you can adapt this with templating and themes and so on for your like company needs. And we have it deployed um, in Zalando. So I uh, use it uh, pretty frequently. It also provides like some power features like just download every view as a, a tab separated value file. Um, so this is all kind of more like plain and simple uh, read only access for multiple clusters. Great. Um, so one of the of the reasons, uh, one of the differences uh, with uh, with the other solutions we looked into is that this one is read only, right? Um, uh, is is the read write capability something you 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 don't need, or do you expect that to be added later? So my focus was really um, deploying this tool in a in a bigger corporate context, something like Zalando, where we have a few thousand developers, and um, like normal changes are done via CI/CD and uh, Git operations. Uh, so uh, I don't really want uh, humans to interact with Kubernetes directly and change something. Um, at least definitely not on production. Uh, so this view um, tool was really made for having a read-only view. That being said, it might make sense to have some write access for emergency situations in the future, uh, but this is really not a focus or priority. So um, right now, um, not really planned. Maybe I'll add something if I see this is really valuable for myself or others. Great. Uh, yeah, and next we, we have... a. Uh a quick um, um, mention uh, to uh, about this project called um, K9. So uh, this is a honorable mention because it does not really fit the, the criteria of having a graphical user interface. But when Henning uh, announced on Twitter uh, that we were doing this talk, uh, many people came and said that you have to check K9s. So uh, yeah, so this is a, um, like I said, this is a, a common line uh, interface tool. Uh, that I would say it's uh, it's like a, an extension to to kubectl uh, if you want uh, because it gives you like a, a quick uh, UI uh, with a listing all the all the resources you have uh, you can change them you can you know describe them you can uh, get a shell uh, into them uh, but this is not a project that you have to either you know run locally as an application with a, with a web view or uh, host in your cluster. Uh, so, so yeah, it's also very customizable if you want to create shortcuts, uh, keyboard shortcuts. That is, um, and uh, and yeah, it seems simple enough. And besides, and very importantly, it has a, a great logo too. So, would you rather use a command line tool like K9s or Lens or Octant for local as a local tool? So, I think you know, day to day, I would use. Uh, I would use, uh, you know, a, a graphical uh, tool, uh, so one that uh, kind of guides me a bit better or a bit more uh, graphically uh, into what I need to to do. Um, but that said, you know, K9s uh, seems like a very nice tool to just if you want to quickly check something or something is going wrong, uh, you can just uh, quickly run it and see what's up. Um, but yeah, uh, for day to day, I would go with the with the full graphical solution. Okay, let's have a quick look at other UIs. So we have um, some UIs which were also mentioned to us, but they require a control plane or something else installed. So the Rancher dashboard UI actually looks um, pretty nice, but it's not available standalone right now. Gardener is uh, mostly for managing clusters. Linkerd and Istio, Kiali um, are service meshes, so you need them installed. Weave Scope is also pretty nice, and uh, but requires a probe app. And Portana um, is not really a generic Kubernetes UI, but now has Kubernetes support and requires some uh, persistency. Yeah, there are also some other projects which I mentioned, uh, for example, in my blog post last year, uh, but some of them are now stale. So Constant Late um, is a stale Cubeman. I uh, want to mention briefly because it has a very nice um, uh, approach uh, with recipes. So you can define recipes for views and uh, queries across clusters, uh, but sadly now also stale. Kubrix, um, stale Kubernetes um, we looked into, but the latest uh, release is uh, one year old in, on Docker Hub and Kubernetes is, was out because it's not open source. 
Okay, uh, we had a look at a lot of different UIs. Uh, Joachim, you also created your own UI. I also created one. Um, so what would be your summary after looking through all these different tools? Yeah, so, uh, you know, definitely the, there are plenty of solutions out there for uh, different use cases. Um, and uh, yeah, and for example, I'm very happy uh, to see that uh, Lens uh, made our, uh, you know, our project overview, uh, which is something it would not have uh, if it were still proprietary. Uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm very happy that it became uh, open source. And that also means that even if it's original creators in, in the company, um, uh, or, or if the company is no longer around, uh, the project can still live on and, and you know, uh, create value for, for its users. One thing that uh, I think it's curious that I um, notice is that many of the, of the projects um, I tested just assume that you have like uh, full uh, administration capabilities or, or a, a full admin role in the, in the cluster. Uh, so whereas, you know, maybe you have a company that, uh, uh, is is you know ha has to really review who can uh, actually edit stuff, uh, update stuff, and delete stuff. Uh, so, so I was curious to to realize that. Um, and yeah, what what do you think on your side? Yeah, I found it interesting that the the tool landscape changes uh, over time. So uh, we now have some stale projects, which might be a little bit sad. But it's also nice to see new projects like KubeNav. I only discovered as part of the preparations for this talk, so it's from this year. And and yeah, maybe there are also new projects in the future. Um, for me personally, it's um, interesting to have this um, like one side of tools which are really uh, used locally, like Octant, Lens, K9s. Um, and which is kind of personal preference, like uh, selecting your personal IDE, right? So it's kind of in a company, um, you don't necessarily want to prescribe this, this local tools. And then there is the other side of um, tools you deploy actually to cluster. And it's really a difference um, whether you now choose a UI based on kind of your personal needs and maybe um, using this for your own cluster or something you deploy into a cluster for your users, which also I need to consider, like you mentioned, this limited cluster access and different roles and maybe just read-only access, et cetera. So in, in Zalando, we use Kubernetes WebView because it's created for many clusters and just read-only access for, for uh, thousands of developers. Um, but this doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right tool for, for your scenario. Um, so definitely check, check out these different tools. And um, yeah, you probably have your list of requirements and needs uh, to, to, to evaluate the tools by. Yeah, and I hope that in that regard we we gave uh, a, a simple uh, but you know but useful overview of different tools. Uh, also, you know, check out the the ones that need the control plane if uh, if, if if that's uh, fine with your deployment too. And um, and yeah, uh, thank you very much for for attending. And uh, if you have questions, we're around. Thank you very much. Thank you.